Some kids want to grow up and pitch game seven at Yankee Stadium, give an Oscar speech, fight fires or terrorists. I wanted to wear the fancy robes on Sundays. Help people. Come on, Muffin. They're many, so you have like 30 of them that are still not that bad for you. Have you been reading much John lately? A little bit more of a Ringo man myself, but sorry. So what's the verdict, Father? Verdict? Is it too late? No, it's just we're really very big on rules around here. I mean, we, we, we can. Daniel. Can I call you Daniel? Now, this isn't magic. We're not special, nor do we have some privileged access to God. We are men who've chosen to serve. You gotta find something of your own, something selfish and stupid and human. What's going on here? Won't you just open your eyes? What's the story? Having a crisis of faith or something else? The world kind of sucks. You don't believe that. No, you don't, which is why I like you, but you're also, you know, you. This is not a game. What is your passion? Such a great trailer. Let's get it going for these guys. The Good Catholic is the film they're here to talk about. Paul Schulberg as a director. I'd love to start with you and, and how the, the idea came to place. So my father was a priest, um, and my, my mom was actually a nun, and they met a long time ago in, in the church, fell in love, and, you know, three kids later. Uh, yeah. So it was, it was based uh, kind of loosely on, on their story, right. and I, it's just one of those stories I took for granted, but... Yeah, and you were a kid, yeah. and you were bringing out the pencil. You're like, what was that story again? Yeah, Dad, yeah. I want to write it's, a script out of it's this. It's one of those things that they have got asked about. You know, my, you know, my whole life, people have always been like, whoa, that's a crazy story. And it's like, no, that's, that's, how, like, that's how babies are born. You know, they start off as nuns and priests, and then they have kids. Isn't that normal? <laughs> <laughs> and when, when did you decide to turn it into a film and, and use it as this, as this project? Uh, my father passed away uh, a few years ago, and that's sort of when I realized that, that it was time to, to dive in and tell this story. Yeah. And, and what about the, the sort of the faith sort of do you find is a good uh, place to put a, uh, the drama behind it? Well, um, it's a world we don't see very often um, told from a, a real human perspective. Uh, priests are many things in pop culture, but they're rarely three dimensional people. Um, and so it was a world uh, just as a writer, when you see a world that's not explored in a way you would like to explore it very often, that's exciting right away because you're starting off with something different. Yeah. And uh, faith was very important to my father. So I, in, in a film that I was writing to really honor his memory, it, it seemed like something, you know, I, I haven't spent a whole lot of my life uh, exploring faith. So it was you know, doing it through the lens of this. I kind of felt like I got a little stuck in, in, that, in that world. Um, some, you know, maybe I'll get into heaven now for doing this, I don't know. <laughs> it's such a sweet story. Um, how did you find uh, Zachary for that lead? Uh, I found Zachary about 10 years before I wrote this story. Down here at the end. Okay, there <laughs> so, we go. Yeah. So some early we, casting we in went your life. To, I, I was in grad school getting my MFA in playwriting, and he was an undergrad uh, actor. And I was I, an archaeology major. Well, <laughs> that was also an actor. Um, I, I, I saw him on a dig, and I was like, that guy should really... Uh, <laughs> but he, he was one of those actors that uh, I knew right away when I saw him in, in a play that this is the, the kind of person that, that I want to work with. And we've we're trying to do stuff for 10 years. Um, and this finally, you know, this, this came about. So I've, I've known him forever. Yeah. Zachary, what was the pitch to you? How do you sort of explain the story? Uh, he said that he wanted to tell a story uh, about his dad uh, more than anything else. And uh, I've, I knew Paul's writing, obviously, for like the past 10 years. And I'm fortunate enough that he sends me every script that he finishes, and you know, I get to be one of the first people to read it. And he sent this to me, and it, it was far and away the best thing that he had ever written. Um, 
and he said that I that he wanted to tell a story about a priest that uh, was unconventional and that really focused on uh, what what it's like when somebody dedicates their entire life to something like that that they're they're still a person yeah. underneath you know they still have thoughts and wants and desires and and that doesn't just go away uh, that's something that that stays and so to to explore that complex relationship between the two uh, that was pretty much the pitch yeah. and then what was your relationship with religion before that and what sort of uh, research did you do into it um, my relationship with religion before that was really uh, my I grew up uh, with a single mother uh, who raised me and she focused on pretty much like every Sunday we would go and learn about a different religion. Uh, it was very unconventional, uh, small town Indiana, um, but we would go and we would learn about a different religion. So we would, you know, we would read the Old Testament, we would read the New Testament, we would read the Torah, we would read the Quran, um, and we just tried to kind of understand the the building blocks of those structures of faith. Um, so that was the place where I was starting from. And then uh, when we started doing the, when we knew that we were going to be doing this, um, I just reached out personally to his mom, first of all, because that's a really good resource. Um, she knows the ins and outs of everything to do with his dad. Um, and the one thing that I kept on coming across was this uh, unique ability to be present and to listen. And that's something that uh, you don't find. It's a rare quality these yeah. days, absolutely. Ren, how about uh, you? How did you come upon, upon this project? Uh, well, lucky for me, I already knew Zach through a theater company that we were both working with called Animus. So he approached me about this project. Uh, and the minute I read the script, I was, I was pretty much like, I'm in. Uh, Paul's writing is phenomenal. Um, I think he captures something in this film that you don't often get to see, which is two people going through what I would call a crisis of faith, one who does believe in God, one who doesn't, and how their worlds colliding changes who they, they are. And I, I feel like the, the version of that that I've seen on film before or in a story has been has been conventional and this to me feels like it's it's turning over a kind of a familiar coin to the other side that people don't often get to see so lucky for me zach contacted me about it i read it uh and then we kind of started the process of hoping that schedules would align mm -hmm. um so yeah did you play guitar before or oh my god <laughs> i was terrified i was absolutely terrified no uh, actually, that's not entirely true. Uh, I played the bass guitar in a band in high school, uh, and the band was called Kelly Likes Lucifer, which is a very important point. Uh, so I know how to play the bass guitar, but not the guitar. And uh, a friend of mine, Jeremy, who worked with me uh, on the song that's in the film, I was like, dude, you've got to help me not look like a, a jerk who doesn't know what I'm doing. So he taught me a way to, to make the chord progression look correct. Yeah. I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to be like, she's cheating. She's totally <laughs> cheating. That is not right. And Paul, how did you convince this guy over here, John, uh, John C., to get in this film? Well, you don't, you don't convince uh, <laughs> this guy to do anything he doesn't want to do. I can tell you that much. Um, I, I, I don't know. We sent him the script. Mm. And from there, uh, I, yeah, it was, we were just fortunate to, that he responded to it. Yeah. John, what you, would you like about the script and the character? I like that uh, he, almost in a Commedia dell'arte way, there, there's always a, a clowner. In Commedia dell'arte, he's called Buffone. Yeah. And so there's a little Buffone in that character. He's kind of the comic relief a little bit, which I was comfortable with. But there, I like to put a little ballast or a little foundation underneath Buffone. And so I had, uh, I don't know, a couple, half dozen, dozen phone calls with Paul. And I said, at some point, we have to explore what this guy actually believes. And so Paul wrote this magnificent um, um, homily about compassion, and we, he let me collaborate with him on it. And it's really all I care about, just from the special needs community, from the Down syndrome community, all I really care about is what you are willing to sacrifice uh, if you're willing to suffer with the people in our community. And so to be able to, to, to weave 
uh, some of the sensibilities of the Down syndrome community tangentially kind of out of frame into uh, Buffune was really fun. I didn't know you were a singer. Is that uh, that's something that came out in there? Could you? Uh, was that something you had a skill before? Or? No, I can fucking sing. <laughs> <laughs> You're belting it out there. You got to pay the bills, whatever it takes, baby. And the whistle too. Can you give us that whistle? Is that a? Come here. <laughs> So choice. Uh, I love the music in this film. I mean, it has some really great moments. How'd you find uh, the the composition? So our composer is, uh, you know, we shot this in Indiana, uh, which a, a lot of us, myself and the producers are, are from that area. Um, and this was a guy that, that I just knew. I, I met randomly. I didn't even know he was a, a musician and we got to be friends and, and he, I found out through other people, the mutual friends that he was and I asked to hear his stuff and I was blown away. This is just some you know, genius kid that lives out in the woods just composing music all the time. And I, I immediately latched onto him. And then we were, we also have a great music supervisor um, who got us, um, you know, we have a few uh, tracks in, in the film as well that uh, really complimented uh, Zachary, the guy's name is Zachary Walter, it's phenomenal. Uh, but to compliment his score, um, he, they helped us find music that would work all together with it. And it was, it's, you know, you always feel really lucky when you find a you know a good composer because it's 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 hard to find that, that absolutely guy. and it's such a beautiful small film but you're able to do little things like that you wouldn't be able to do in a studio studio project where you can just find somebody and put it into your yeah. film was there any other examples of that I mean sort of uh, background or people that sort of uh, shine oh, oh yeah I mean we we have we were there's we have a nice balance of talent from uh, New York and L A um, and and some Chicago but half of our our crew are Indiana people. Mm. That that some of these people were working on their first film, mm. and you know it was it was so nice to be able to blend those two worlds and to really show uh, show both um, people that work in the industry all the time um, what people are capable of doing when given an opportunity, and then to show these people that are getting the opportunity how how the professionals do it. It was just a really nice uh, blending of. Of worlds, then. yeah, absolutely. And speaking of unknown talents, I mean, Danny Glover. I mean, he comes out of nowhere, young, young you kid, him. upstart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about working with him and uh, some stories from set there. Dan Danny Glover is like a magician. Um, if you talk to him, in, just in person, one on one, he's just this reserved, nice, very, uh, very genuine, like loving man. But but not a not not this big personality. And then you turn the camera on. And you could even be sitting in the room and being like, he's, and then you look through the monitor and like, oh, he's a star. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, and he just, he just brings uh, a weight uh, to, to every word he says. And it, it's, it's just kind of magic. You have to sort of just let happen. And it, and it does, so. There's a gravitas there for sure. I mean, John, what was it like working with Danny, squaring off with him a, a little bit? Um, I really enjoyed, uh, Danny's a great raconteur. Uh, he's one of the one a really skilled storyteller, and so uh, to hear him tell stories about Dr. King and about what was going on in San Francisco when San Francisco was exploding in the '60s, for those of us who weren't there, uh, and then he lived in Paris for a while, and he was with Thelonious Monk, and he was with all these great jazz musicians, and he can recount it in the most detailed and and lovely way without boasting or without being, uh, look at me, uh, I was in all these relevant places, but just uh, letting you in on some of the stuff that was going on in Haight-Ashbury and some of the stuff that was going on in the jazz clubs in Paris and with Dr. King in Memphis. And you're like, wow, yeah. it's just a real treat. And uh, Zachary working with uh, two heavyweights as a relative newcomer. I mean, working with John relative? C. Yeah, exactly. Very there we go. Yeah. Uh, working with John C. and Danny Glover. I mean, what's it like to sort of uh, square off with those guys? I'm going to include Ren in that yes, lineup, absolutely. too, because um, uh, it was terrifying, first of all, um, and because in every single scene, uh, uh, stacking up against the three of them uh, was intimidating. Um, but it started to make the job a lot easier every single scene that we got into because act acting opposite you and John and, and Danny, it forces you to be better. Um, and it challenged me in ways that I, I never even thought possible as an actor. Um, and all three of them bringing very unique 
uh, ways of working. Um, that it's it's great to kind of like drop into Ren's world and then drop into John's world and Danny's world. It, it, you never get comfortable, which I think is good as an actor or an artist. Yeah, and there's some great scenes around the dinner table. I mean, was there any cracking up? Because there's some choice lines that are, that, are, that are sent out there. You can only imagine being at a dinner table with John C. There's a little cracking, there's a little breaking, right? <laughs> I just, every time, uh, I, there's only one dinner scene where Ren and I get to be together. I think it's the only scene in the movie we get to be together. And I, uh, I reached out to Ren the minute we saw each other at the uh, breakfast uh, room of the, of the hotel we were staying. And I just admired her and I thought she was incredibly cool and, and smart and really great. And so that admiration for her uh, reduces how much you have to act when someone calls action, yeah. because that was also part of the script that that he, this progressive priest, is not in any way uh, put off by uh, Zach bringing a, a female to uh, the rectory dinner table, right. and so I I just uh, I find it's much easier and less laborious if you can if there's some semblance of contact mm -hmm. that you can bring in pregame to the set. Not in a manipulative way, in, in real life. I just saw this, this beautiful, incredibly talented woman and I was like, let's have some coffee. And so we did and it was lovely. We were both strangers in Bloomington and we just kind of hung out. Yeah. And the lens loves it, the lens just soaks that up. Yeah. How were those muffins, by the way, we saw in the trailer there, those gluten-free? I ate a uh, shitload <laughs> of those things. <laughs> I'm not yeah, a muffin guy I either. I had to get some muffins after I'm I not saw a muffin the movie, guy. to be honest. <laughs> I called Zach's character in Scrubs muffin for like nine seasons. My little bitch muffin. I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Thank you for not, uh, so not nicknaming me that. That's, that's very kind. You know, I uh, yeah, give him a nickname right now. He feels left uh, out. Uh, movie we'll star. give you a moment to think about it. Exactly. I don't give a, give a, he's great in the movie. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, Paul, what's, what's next for you? What kind of stories do you want to keep on telling these? I love, I mean, there's a lack of these sort of small, heartfelt, beautiful stories. I mean, we need more of these in theaters. Is this where you want to sort of stay? And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, in pre-production for another feature right now, um, which is kind of crazy doing both these at the same time. But uh, it's, a, it's a film about somebody who has a unique ability to help people let go um, and pass away, terminally ill people, um, but she can't relate to anybody else. Um, and so it's a, it is in the vein of, it's a small story, a lot of heart, a lot of life, literal life and death uh, things happening. And yeah, I, I want to, I just want to keep doing this. It's, you don't, you know, there's not a lot of movies being made anymore that aren't yeah. huge. Yeah. And uh, I, I love television, but uh, I, I want to, you know, movies are the thing that I, you know, I want to make as many as I can. Are you going to keep on putting Zachary in movies? Is that going to is that going to work out? I think I'm legally obligated to do so <laughs> at this point. Um, so yeah. yeah. Zachary, you want to keep on collaborating with this guy? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I think I think I've got some something to do in the next movie, but uh, yeah. as the days go by. I think I saw something we'll see how MVP good Catholic does like and that. then they'll be like, "No, no, put put uh, someone much more famous." No, I mean, it, this played at the festival in uh, uh, Santa, Santa Barbara, Barbara exactly, and it, it now it's coming out. I mean, it's been such a long journey. How's it? It must be really exciting to see it finally coming out in theaters and getting those responses. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, this is. It, it's weird. Any time a movie comes out, by the time it's out, it's it's been a year and a half since um, since it's, it's been locked done. In, and yeah, yeah and so it's it's kind of um, it's a little surreal, but it's it's nice because you can't sit there and just wait for that movie for a year and a half. So you move on. I mean, it's nice to come back to it and you get a little distance, and then you can appreciate it as as a movie and not as a thing that you know when it's when you're working on it, you're not appreciating it. You're just you're just working, you know, trying to get it done. So it's nice to come back to it. Absolutely. And, and Ren, what's next for you? I know you have a couple of uh, television shows that are going right now. And I do. Uh, a show called Looming Tower for Hulu. Very excited um, about this, yeah. Not sure when it uh, is going to officially drop, but for those of you in the audience who maybe have not heard of it, it's about the turf war between the CIA and the FBI leading up to 9-11. Uh, so really light subject matter. It's a comedy. The research uh, <laughs> was a little different for that one. I probably yeah. Actually, uh, I didn't realize before I dived into that that 
as far as pop culture goes, uh, I think a lot of people are way more familiar with the FBI than the CIA, and I play a CIA analyst in that show. And I was like, wait a minute, I know the CIA is concerned with gathering intelligence, but beyond that, like, who are they? What do they do? So it was a, a really unique opportunity to learn more about that community, which is hard because they don't want you to know anything about them. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> what some of the secrets? What did, you, what did you learn through the process? What were you surprised by, perhaps? Um, well, I... I feel like this kind of goes without saying, even though I didn't maybe think of this before I spoke with a former CIA op. Um, the people who work for the CIA are, uh, never are expecting a pat on the back. They work in secret. Um, they're, in my opinion, warriors for our country. And the only time you ever see the CIA in the news is when the shit hits the fan. Um, which is unfortunate because they're all working as hard as they can to keep everybody safe. Uh, and usually they're, they're only in the news when something's gone horribly wrong. Um, so I have a, a unique respect for that community despite some of the mistakes that have been made. Um, and I also, I don't know how you work in the world that we live in to keep people safe given how quickly things happen now. Especially these days, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I look forward to that. And uh, John, what's next for you? What's uh, what's coming? I mean, obviously I'm excited for this, but... Uh, Season two of Stand Against Evil on IFC, Love that film, absolutely. 1st. You were here to talk about it that last time. And so, uh, that's what we, we finished cutting it uh, a couple weeks ago. Now we're sweetening the music and the effects and... Now we'll come back and do Comic-Con uh, in October, and then it'll uh, have a life second season. Can't wait for that. And we're coming up on, I have to ask you, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of Wall Street. You have to give us a, great, a Wall Street story. What was it like to be on that set? Uh, Wall Street was great. Uh, we only shot for uh, two and a half, three weeks down at the Woolworth Building. I was doing talk radio over at the public at night and Wall Street during the day. And so, so it's kind of a New York actor's dream. Uh, and I had... Uh, in my contract, I was to be wrapped at 7.15 every day so that when you do a play, you have to be there a half hour ahead of time. It's called equity half hour, equity being the union of stage actors. And you have to be there at half hour. And you want to be there at half hour to do a vocal warm up and be present. And Oliver, kept, Oliver Stone kept keeping me later and later. And the Teamster kept bringing me up to the public even later and later. And so one day I got there at five of and my understudy was in my wardrobe and I was like, get the fuck out of my wardrobe. <laughs> Because the jinx to ever, you know, the Lou Gehrig Wally Pip, you're never ever supposed to not go on. And so uh, I went on and about 20 minutes into the play, I have this monologue where I come down to a, the closest you can be to the audience on a proscenium stage is the light cue is called down in one. So I get to go down in one, a pin spot hits me, and I get to tell this seven minute story about how I know Eric Bogosian's character. And I got about a minute into it, and I couldn't remember the next goddamn line <laughs> because Oliver had been yelling at Charlie and I all day on the set and it was a really bad day. Charlie Sheen. Yeah, Charlie Sheen. Uh, and I just stood there down in one with a pin spot on me for, if it was a minute, it was 30 seconds, but it might as well have been a half an hour. And it was a tiny little room over at the public, maybe 325 seats. And it was the hottest ticket in town because Eric was so magnificent. And I just stood in front of them for about a minute or so, and I, then I just went back to my desk, and we continued the play. And so that was pretty horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a favorite line your character said in Wall Street? Is there a favorite? I mean, there's so many gems. In Wall Street? In Wall Street. Nicks and chicks. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, when I tell uh, Charlie, when I'm promising him not to be like Hal Holbrook's character, um, because he wants to stay and grind after work and do homework, I say, I'm promising you the Knicks and chicks. There we go. And, that's, uh, that's the life motto right there. Yeah. That's so good. And so uh, we have some, uh, Hal's <laughs> character from the new it. Um, We have some questions in the audience. We're going to start right there. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. How are you? Very well, thank you. So, Ren, this question is for you. What was your religious background like growing up? Do you consider yourself a spiritual person? And how did that translate over into your role? Uh, very easy question. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so I was raised uh, Presbyterian um, and was very much ensconced in that community until I was about 16 when I dated a young man who was agnostic and did not believe in God. And he said to me one day, point blank, well, do you think I'm going to hell? And there was just something about that in that moment where a penny dropped because I couldn't reconcile who he was uh, as a person with that 
dogma and the religion that I believed in. And it maybe took me about 10 years, I feel like, to kind of walk the path of becoming someone who believes in very much a spiritual energy but doesn't believe in religious dogma anymore. Um, I read a book by a guy named Sam Harris. If you know who that is, uh, he's fully kind of about blowing up uh, organized religion, um, at least the parts of it that I think have a really negative impact on our world. Um, but one of the things that attracted me to Paul's uh, writing as well as to this character specifically is that she's a, a woman who is obsessed with death because it's the only thing that makes her feel alive, uh, which I think is a really powerful motivator. Um, and for me, that was a really exciting idea to explore. Uh, and also what it means to be a person who's in a crisis of faith if you don't believe in God, uh, which I also think is something that's very relevant um, in our current world. Um, so it was kind of fun, I think, as as we, the story kind of was unfolding to play with all of these old ideas that are still very much a part of me, but at the same time to kind of set fire to them as a way of shocking this other character um, to see kind of what's there. Um, so yeah, I feel like I kind of was able to bring all of that to this story and then just kind of run with it because our script uh, and the story there was so incredibly powerful. It's a great question. Yeah, Thank great you. question. Uh, next one. Nice. Being here. Um, so I want to know, this might be a little bit challenging because considering the content of the film, but if you could describe the movie in one sentence, what would you say? Uh, For all me? of you. <laughs> I would say the film's uh, in one sentence. Uh, it juxtaposes uh, faith with a devotion to love. Uh, can I just say ditto? <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Put that on the poster. That's pretty great. Okay, I like that one. We're just going to end with that one. Okay, one last question. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, so the tagline is, what is your passion? Uh, I was like wondering, at what point in your lives did you know what your passions were? Were they always film and acting? And uh, do you feel that there's a connection with faith, having faith in something and, and having passion and going towards your passion? Um, I, I do. Like, I, I often tell people that you know I'm not a particularly religious person, but I feel when I'm writing or when I go and watch a movie in the theater specifically, um, I, I always say that I, I feel like I'm getting out of that what I think religious people are getting out of going to church on Sunday. Um, and so I, I do think that if you're passionate about anything, um, you're connected to it in a very deep way. And I, I think that they're very, like, it's not, it's not hard for me to think about um, what a priest would be going through because um, if, if they're passionate about their faith, um, I, like anyone that's passionate about something understands passion. And so I think that that is very much connected. And I, I got, uh, I've known for, in my early 20s, I, I kind of figured out that this is all I wanted to do. So yeah, it's been there for a while. Um, I wanted to be a storyteller from as long back as I can remember. Uh, whatever storytelling looked like, whether it was putting on the talent show at the Thanksgiving for the aunts and uncles after dinner or w however that metamorphosized. Uh, and as far as faith and what was the second part of the question? With religion and, and actors? Between having faith and going towards your passion, like having faith in what you want. Um, I don't know. For, for actors, you got to remember when actors go into auditions and stuff, they're not nine nine out of ten times we get rejected and so and what's being rejected isn't or ten or ten out of ten what's being rejected isn't the coffee cup salesman who's someone doesn't want the coffee cup what they're rejecting is us and so the trap for actors is your 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 skin can get a little thick and and so you can protect yourself um, but if that happens you might lose the magic the magic stuff the the vulnerable the loveliness and so actors somehow have to protect themselves uh, but not lose their loveliness. And so there has to be some faith in there somehow, some way that you believe in yourself, even though what we're rejecting 10 out of 10 times is you. We don't want you. We're going to make the film, <laughs> just not with you. <laughs> and so that hurts. And if it hurts too much, you'll either do something else or you'll get too tough or you'll 
find a way, which is hard. And so when, when you have working actors who accomplish that, it's, uh, it's, quite, a, it's quite a feat. Um, I have to say ditto again, because my, my beginning as an actor started uh, as a young uh, toddler on a trampoline uh, singing to Whitney Houston in my Jane Fonda workout gear. And like this whole powder blue get up <laughs> with some like faux free weights. Um, and I would perform for anyone that would watch. Um, once Annie was on my radar, I was very into Mrs. Hannigan or Miss Hannigan. Um, I always have wanted to play Miss Hannigan. Annie is, you know, is the thing that when you have red hair, people are like, oh, you'd be a great Annie. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Miss Hannigan. Yeah, she's the great part. Um, and then as far as uh, Faith, um, this I think sounds a little bit like I'm petting a crystal rock over here, but I feel like there has to, when you're an actor, you have to have a certain amount of faith in humanity and in communication and in being present and in telling stories because that's a thing that we've been doing as long as we've had language. Uh, it's a very communal event. Uh, I, in some ways, mourn the fact that I can now watch anything I want at home because I feel like when you're in a theater or movie theater and everybody's having a shared experience, it is quite holy. I remember watching Get Out in New York City up near Union Square and that theater was just like raucous. It was amazing. It's one of the most exciting things I've seen with people in a long time. Um, and there's something really significant and special about that. Uh, yeah, I've always been very passionate about storytelling. Um, but for me, it started, it started in a very different way. I started making movies when I was eight years old. Um, and it was all about like grabbing your friends and running out into the backyard and seeing if you can't make like the bad guy out of styrofoam so you can throw a knife at it and have it stick and you know like all of the that really great filmmaking that you do at age eight um and like duct taping a camera to a pvc pipe while you're driving down the highway because you really want that dolly shot um and that's kind of how it started for me and i started to realize during this process specifically is that what what i was really passionate about and it ties into what I'm faithful in, is people. And it's people, what I love about film sets is that it's people all coming together to, for one common goal. And everybody has a completely different job. And everybody has different responsibilities. And everybody's bringing different ideas and everything to the table. And somehow you're getting all of these people together at the exact same time to figure out how you're gonna tell this story. That means that the story itself must be pretty important. If you manage to get these people to nowhere, you know, small town Indiana, then it must mean that the story that you're trying to tell is pretty important. And, uh, and the only way that we were able to do any of this is to be able to have faith in people at every single step of the way. So I think if you believe in people, um, there's, there's really nothing that you can't do. Well said. Well, uh, the good Catholic is the film. And like Ren said, the magic is in the theaters. So tell all your friends about it. Get them in the theaters this week. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. <laughs>